Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age there would be an increase in deception false christ who will deceive many wars and rumors of wars nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom famines pestilences earthquakes christian persecution apostasy false prophets and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor as the labor progresses the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes as we get closer to jesus return all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense all of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time an alarming announcement by Russia's President Vladimir Putin, who says he's moving nuclear weapons inside Russia's ally, Belarus. He made the announcement in a meeting with the president of Belarus. The move would put nuclear weapons within easy reach of targets inside Ukraine. NATO called Vladimir Putin's announcement irresponsible, and other Western leaders threatened new sanctions. Ramy Inocencio has the latest. Bakhmu, blasted by Russia beyond recognition, the situation after Russia's eight-month assault finally stabilizing, says Ukraine's top army commander. Now, as the West deploys more weapons to Ukraine, Russian President Vladimir Putin is raising the stakes himself, saying he will deploy tactical nuclear weapons to Belarus with 10 Belarusian fighter jets already retrofitted and arguing he's doing what the U.S. has been doing for years by stationing its nuclear weapons in Western Europe. NATO calls that misleading. The White House reacted cautiously. We've in, sec in fact seen no indication that he has any intention to use nuclear weapons, period, inside Ukraine. Nothing that would cause us to change our own strategic deterrent posture. A top Ukraine official said the Kremlin has taken Belarus as a nuclear hostage. NATO criticized Putin's rhetoric as dangerous and irresponsible. <laughs> And ratcheting tensions higher in Russia, an explosion about 100 miles south of Moscow on Sunday. The Kremlin claiming it downed a Ukrainian drone, injuring three people, leaving this 15-foot crater and damaging buildings. And following Russia's nuclear threat, Ukraine is now demanding an emergency session at the United Nations. Kyiv accusing Moscow of not being a responsible steward of nuclear weapons, using them now for intimidation. Luke 21:25. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days, right before the return of Jesus Christ, is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. We're going to begin with the breaking news from Israel with the deepening turmoil there over Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's move to limit the independence of the country's Supreme Court. Weeks and weeks of protests have led to this. You're looking at the scene outside the Israeli legislature. That's the Knesset in Jerusalem. And a new wave of protest erupted yesterday after the defense minister there was fired for calling for a delay in this plan until after Easter and Passover. This morning, labor unions called for a general strike, and the protests may have actually forced Netanyahu and his right-wing government to reconsider or at least consider a pause. Charlie Daggett is following this story from London. Charlie, good morning. Israel is bracing for further protests today, and the prime minister is facing the greatest threat yet to his coalition government. There are now reports that you mentioned he may halt that overhaul following a long night of nationwide demonstrations. Organizers called for a night of chaos, and demonstrators by the tens of thousands delivered. Protesters poured onto the streets of Tel Aviv, taking over the main highway, shouting, Israel is not a dictatorship, blowing air horns, blocking traffic, and burning tires. Riot police deployed water cannon, drenching the crowds. It's not a matter of left or right. It's a matter of pure, basic human rights that are being crushed daily. 
Protests also broke out in Jerusalem, around the Israeli legislative building, and outside the home of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, shouting, shame, shame. The eruption came on the back of Netanyahu's firing of his defense minister for breaking ranks with the prime minister's hardline policies. The growing rift in our society is penetrating the Israeli defense force and security agencies, said Yoav Gallant. It poses a clear, immediate and tangible threat to the security of the state. Critics have come down hard on Netanyahu's highly controversial plans to overhaul the judicial system. The proposals would see government control over the appointment of judges, including the Supreme Court, while restricting the court's rights to veto legislation or rule against the government. That's been met with weeks of anti-government protests and nationwide strikes. Unions have gone on strike, shutting down the universities and grounding flights out of Israel's main airport. Another mass demonstration has been called for this afternoon outside of parliament. After a night of nationwide protests, demonstrations and riots surrounding Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's judicial reform plan and his firing of Israel's defense minister. As Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem, many believe Israel's current crisis is one of the most dangerous times since the Yom Kippur War 50 years ago. We're watching footage of some of the ongoing protests and demonstrations. Are these making uh, Israel more vulnerable in the Middle East? I think almost everybody on uh, both sides of this argument can, can agree that it is making Israel look weaker in the eyes of its enemy, enemies. Gallant himself warned in one of a committee meeting this morning, it's an opportunity for Israel's enemies to attack Israel. Uh, Iran itself is trying to erode relations between Israel and its Sunni Arab nations. Hezbollah is rejoicing over these protests. One senior defense official said that the tensions over judicial reform were leading Israel's enemies to see it as weak. So this is a very dangerous time for Israel uh, in the eyes of not only its friends, but its enemies in the region. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict, and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. This prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. Really a time, Ephraim, to be praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Psalm 122.6 Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Praying for the peace of Jerusalem means praying for Jesus' return, as he is the only one who brings true peace when he returns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords at his second coming. Protesters were out on the streets for the ninth day running Thursday and were met with police batons and tear gas. In the southwest city of Bordeaux, the door of the 18th century town hall was set ablaze before firefighters put it out 15 minutes later. Clashes also broke out in Nantes, where protesters broke in and ransacked an administrative court. And in the northern French town of Lille. It was the most violent day since the nationwide stoppages began in mid-January. When 441 police officers are attacked with Molotov cocktails and stones, when they're physically attacked to the point that some are still in hospital, the far left wants to attack the republic. We need to send them a collective message of condemnation, and the instruction now given to police officers is to use a certain amount of force. Unions and opposition parties blame the government for not heeding the mounting public anger. The president must take note of what is happening in the country. Unfortunately, he is gambling with violence. He is gambling with chaos in the country. In just a matter of days, we have gone from peaceful protests to police batons. Earlier in the day, over a million mainly peaceful protesters marched across France, according to the Interior Ministry. Unions put the turnout at 3.5 million, equaling a previous high on March 7th. The movement was given new momentum after a defiant Emmanuel Macron refused to back down on his pension reform in an interview the night before. I didn't even want to watch him because he disgusts me so much. Then I listened to the conclusions. He despises us. I'm so angry at him. 
They're angry not just at the reform they say is unfair, but also at the president's use of special powers that forced through the bill without a National Assembly vote. Unions have called for further strikes and protests on Tuesday. Opposition leader Raila Odinga and his supporters in Nairobi trying to find their way to the city centre. Protesters were heading to the president's office and state house. They did not get far. This is a protest against the rising cost of basic commodities, inflation, taxes and electoral reforms. In opposition areas like this one, police were prepared. They cordoned off all roads, but that did not stop the demonstrators. Several people were arrested, including politicians. The protesters are saying they will not give up until their demands are met. They're calling this a revolution. Life is hard. The economy is doing badly. Basic commodity prices have skyrocketed. The president said he would reduce prices in the first 100 days, but he has not done much. We gave President William Ruto the mandate to rule. We thought he would make things easier. We woke up early to go vote for him. Next time, I might not even bother to go vote. Now the protesters and their leaders say this is not the end, and they won't stop until President William Ruto and his government listen to what they're saying. This protest has been called by supporters of South Africa's third largest party, the Economic Freedom Fighters. And they say it's about the rising cost of living, unemployment and crippling power cuts. Their leader, Julius Malema, says he wants President Cyril Ramaphosa to resign. He accuses him of corruption and mismanaging the country's energy crisis. If he doesn't resign, what is your next step? Protest is not an event. It's continuous. We'll continue to fight until he steps down. Some areas in South Africa can go without electricity for more than 10 hours a day. The power disruptions are affecting businesses, homes and slowing down economic growth. Thousands of environmental activists in western France clashed with police on Saturday during a demonstration against irrigation reservoirs in the rural community of saint soline According to French authorities, 28 police officers were injured, two of them seriously, and seven protesters, three of whom are in critical condition. Proponents of the reservoir say it's necessary to allow farmers to continue to grow crops, but critics call it a move by angry business to monopolize water supply. Is global chaos the new normal? As anyone can plainly see, the world is in a state of decay, moral, economic, political, every way possible. People are saying the world is out of control and looking for someone, anyone, to rescue the planet. Soon, very soon, a leader will appear on the horizon that appears to have all the answers, to calm the oceans, to bring peace to all the nations. His title will be the Antichrist and he will be welcomed by millions of those on earth not taken with the rapture. Unfortunately, his true identity will be known soon to those left behind that his true intentions are death, destruction, and control. So yes, global chaos is the new normal until the Lord Jesus Christ comes at the end of the Antichrist's seven-year reign of terror and establishes true peace on earth. It seems like a good time for Satan to present the lawless one to the world. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7-12 for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure 
and unrighteousness. The aftermath of the devastating tornado outbreak that tore through the South. Our hearts go out to all of those communities. Since Friday, there have been at least 27 reported tornadoes in five states, and you are looking live at some of the destruction in Mississippi. More than two dozen people killed, an entire city basically destroyed. These are before and after satellite pictures of Rolling Fork, virtually nothing left but rubble. The devastation here in Rolling Fork is so widespread, sometimes it takes a minute for your eyes to actually adjust to what you're seeing here. This here is the underbelly of a bus tossed on its side, surrounded by random household items, some appliances over there. People here tell me they were bracing for bad weather, even the possibility of tornadoes, but never expected anything like this. This morning, the massive cleanup efforts underway after the region was devastated by this monster EF4 tornado on the ground for over an hour, killing more than two dozen people. Is there a big tornado? AccuWeather capturing the nearly mile-wide tornado as it cut a 60-mile path of destruction across Mississippi. In Amory, school surveillance video showing a different tornado ripping through the hallways, debris raining from the ceiling. I know we can rebuild, but what you do with the devastation, what you do with all the... <laughs> A local meteorologist watching the tornado approach, praying for those in its path. Oh, man. Dear Jesus, please help them. Amen. The tornado's hitting at the most dangerous time after dark. All I could hear was breaking wonders. It come through my house. Much of Rolling Fork, Mississippi, unrecognizable, reduced to rubble stretching for miles. And you can see just the power of this EF4 tornado uprooting trees. And take a look at this large SUV that clearly went airborne, now resting on this pile of debris. Governor Tate Reeves touring the disaster zone with FEMA. We remain committed to the people of Mississippi. We will be here for you now. We will be here for you next week. Refrigerator, stove. Local police officer and Antoine freezing. Jones and his girlfriend survived by hunkering down in their bathtub. That sounded like a, a train, a loud train coming through. The entire house ripped to pieces around them. Once we grabbed each other, that's when the tub came off the foundation and we began to roll in the inside. The debris falling on top of us and all we were doing is holding each other, just praying. And this morning, we're learning more about the lives lost. Two-year-old Aubrey died during the brutal storms in Silver City, Mississippi. Her aunt standing with our Rob Marciano in front of the wreckage where the family home once stood. It's so sad because, like, I'm just standing here, and I can just see her at the door smile. It's just so heartbreaking. It's a shock to everybody. Baby Aubrey's seven-year-old cousin, badly injured, now fighting for his life in the ICU. Rodney Pierce mourning the loss of his dad, L.A., and Melissa, his stepmom. The couple killed when a semi truck landed on their roof, crushing their home. We finally found them over here laying under that 18 wheeler. You know, he was on his back and she was just laying beside him with her arm on him. But amid all of this devastation and loss, the community trying to heal. Parishioners at the Rolling Fork United Methodist Church bowing their heads in prayer. The roof now ripped off, but the survivors united, giving thanks for what they have. And the mayor of Rolling Fork, who also happens to be the funeral director here, tells me that he lost a number of friends, uh, and the community is just simply devastated. They've gone through so much. He says that most of the area here is uninhabitable. Almost all the buildings have been wiped out, nearly a total loss. There are still a few left standing, but those that are still uh, there are so heavily damaged that people mostly can't go inside. The tornado also damaged dozens of structures in West Point, Georgia. ABC News meteorologist Samara Theodore has more on the latest there. That tornado in West Point, Georgia, touched down yesterday, and this comes on the heels of the Rolling Fork tornado. You can see the imagery looks eerily similar. So we are going to wait for the National Weather Service to get out there and survey it, by, but I anticipate this is a very strong tornado that touched down yesterday. The U.S. average is about 84 tornadoes during the month of March, uh, and Mississippi usually averages around five tornadoes down that way. The devastation is just uh, unreal in areas like Rolling Forks, Mississippi. We're going to continue to keep an eye on this, but severe weather season is starting to really ramp up now. In the news these days, we read about and see devastating events, each more unusual, destructive, and unprecedented than the last.
They are happening more frequently and more intensely, just as the Bible said would happen just before the return of Jesus Christ. It seems as though God has lifted his hand of protection from the United States, and not just the U.S., but the world as well. These devastating events are not accidents, nor are they merely the natural cycle of things. The world is enduring events that are designed to bring about the end of days and cause us to repent. God is lifting his hand of protection from the nations of the world. No, things will never get back to normal. They will only get worse. As the birth pains continue to become more frequent and more intense, one has to wonder, how close are we to the rapture and the seven-year tribulation? Iraq's Prime Minister has ordered the suspension of working hours in all provinces of the country on account of heavy rainfall and bad weather conditions. On the streets of Najaf in southern Iraq, cars, shops and workplaces were submerged while in the neighborhood of Al-Amir, several families had to leave their homes. Iraq is the fifth most vulnerable nation in the world to the effects of climate change, including water and food insecurity. A raging wildfire in eastern Spain has forced hundreds of people to leave their homes. Emergency services were alerted about the blaze in the region of Valencia at lunchtime on Thursday. Military firefighters worked through the night to try to get it under control. Earlier in the day, large plumes of smoke filled the sky over Villanueva de Viva, as many local villagers decided to head for safety. Yes, we are worried. We did not expect this. But this is the result of the forest having been abandoned. It's a shame. Three villages of more than 1,000 people are reported to have been evacuated. Emergency services said they had set up a refuge for 600 people and a field hospital. It marks Spain's first wildfire this year and follows a winter which, according to EU scientists, was the second warmest on record and unusually dry, while the month of February saw record low levels of soil moisture in some areas. A few days ago, a mother in New Jersey called Angela Redding found out that her child's elementary school was advertising something called pansexuality, and she thought this seems a little much for an elementary school, so she complained about it on Facebook. What happened next didn't used to happen in this country and never should, and we only know about it because of a substack called Chaos and Control, which broke the story. And as we read it, we thought, this can't be real, but it is. So in response to Angela Redding's post, out of the blue, an army officer at Joint Base MDL, it's a nearby military base, called Angela Redding an extremist on Facebook. That officer is called Lieutenant Colonel Christopher Schilling. Schilling then wrote on Facebook that, quote, the Joint Base leadership have had the security forces working with multiple state and local law enforcement agencies to monitor the situation. What? So the military responded to a mom in an elementary school complaining about the sexualization of her own child? That's a, warranted a military response under Joe Biden? Apparently it did. Then shortly after, the chief of the North Hanover Police Department, Robert Duff, pressured Redding to delete her Facebook post. Let that sink in. The police and the military got involved because a mom wrote something on Facebook they didn't like. Today, Joint Base MDL confirmed to this show that they, quote, notified law enforcement about the social media exchange, which is common information sharing practice among law enforcement agencies. Except, wait a second, a military base is not a, quote, law enforcement agency. The purpose of the military is to defend us from foreign enemies, not to police our Facebook posts. This is mind boggling, and we pray someone does something about it. Angela Redding is the mother who wrote that Facebook post that the military shut down. She joins us tonight. Angela, thank you so much for being brave enough to come on. Were you a little surprised that the US military weighed in on your Facebook post? Um, I was more than surprised. Um, I was scared. I actually pulled my kids from school the day I found out. It was, it was mind boggling and I was worried for them. When the US military comes after you for simply raising concern about a public poster that is widely available for all to see, it, it's just, it's, it's mind boggling, as you said. And just to be clear, you weren't threatening war. You didn't threaten <laughs> to use nuclear weapons against the school, correct? 
No, actually, my post was really moderate. It essentially said that I didn't think my seven-year-old was age appropriate to be um, exposed to words such as polysexual and pansexual. I said that all people are deserving, deserving of love and respect. That my post was very explicit about that. And still it prompted this response and, and it, it is really scary that in this country we can't have a right to speak and raise concerns that, uh, about our public education system. You live in an area with a lot of military families. I know, I think your children's school has a lot of military families Correct. in it. I mean, you, and I, doubtless you respect the military because almost all Americans do. Um, did you know that they were reading your Facebook posts? I did not think that the military was uh, monitoring mom's Facebook posts. No, I did not. Uh, no, <laughs> and, and you would hope that Lieutenant Colonel Schilling would be removed from his command like, tonight, um, and we'll be seeing uh, if he is. What was the role of the police chief? Can you just tell us that quickly? So I actually um, got a call from the admin of the Facebook group. Again, this is kind of ridiculous. We're talking about this. This was a, it's a parents group that I posted on. I got a call from the admin of the Facebook group, uh, group saying that the police chief contacted her to say that my post should be, co should come down. Um, and she said, what do you think? I said, well, I don't want Homeland Security coming after me. Take the post down. Like, I, I don't want to be dealing with this. So I agreed that the post could come down. I then contacted the police chief directly and reminded him of the First Amendment <laughs> and that we shouldn't be utilizing government resources and our positions to pressure individuals to take down fo uh, Facebook posts. There was nothing wrong. It didn't violate any law. It didn't violate any Facebook rule whatsoever. So uh, that's how that all happened. And you know, we're here today. I hope Chief Huff is relieved of his post immediately, too, because that's just, that's, I've never heard of anything like this, and I hope I never hear it again. And this theory only operates against parents with conservative views. We have, an, we have a two-tier system of justice in this country. We've seen it again and again under the current administration, and this is just another example of this. Angela, what do you uh, want to see happen here? The reason that, that I'm pursuing this litigation is because Somebody needs to stand up to this government corruption and censorship, and I want to be that person, and I hope that it exposes the widespread, you know, and pervasive, I would say, censorship and labeling of parents as terrorists throughout our country. I'm not the only person. This has been something throughout the news over the past, well, since the Biden administration. Brothers and sisters, persecution is coming. Believers in Jesus Christ believe in the authority of the Bible. We believe homosexuality is a sin and marriage is between one man and one woman. We believe in the sanctity of life and that abortion is murder and is a sin. We believe God created us male and female and it is a sin to identify as a transgender. We believe Jesus is the only way to heaven and that believing in any other way will send a person to hell. Get yourself spiritually prepared because true Christians will be persecuted like no other time in history. This persecution will be based off of what the world perceives to be moral and right, and not what the Bible says. The sad thing is that many people who profess to be Christ followers will go the way of the world. These professing Christians are called lukewarm in the book of Revelation and are not saved. The world will persecute true Christians, and scripture tells us the lukewarm Christians will persecute them as well, as we read in Matthew 24, 9 and 10. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Many who professed faith in Jesus as the Messiah in easier times will deny him and cooperate in exposing those who are true believers. The external hatred from the world puts all true believers in Christ under pressure. This in turn produces internal hatred among the professing Christian community during the tribulation. When the pressure comes, those who are not genuine believers will do three things. Fall away, deliver up one another, and hate one another. Matthew 24, 9 and 10 lay out a future time of great persecution for true believers in Jesus. Many in the church will avoid this persecution by betraying fellow disciples in Christ to the persecutors. Persecution is coming. Student teachers from a Christian university are now banned from a public school system. 
all because of their university's biblical mission statement. And that's the decision made by an Arizona elementary school district. The school board voted unanimously to cancel its contract with Arizona Christian University after an LGBT member raised concerns. Their action was quickly followed by outrage over religious discrimination and the threat of a multi-million dollar lawsuit. For the past 11 years, Arizona Christian University and Washington Elementary School School district had a partnership where ACU students could student teach in the district's public schools. Weeks ago, that relationship ended when the school board cut ties because of the university's biblical beliefs on marriage and sexuality. While I full heartedly believe in religious freedom and people being able to practice whatever faith that they have, I had some very concerned concerns regarding looking at this particular institution. In February, the five-member Washington Elementary School Board voted unanimously to not renew the student-teacher contract with Arizona Christian University. Though she said she supports religious freedom, LGBTQ board member Tamila Valenzuela took issue with the school's mission statement, which includes providing a biblically integrated education. How does that hold space for our members of the LGBT community? How does that hold space for people who think differently and do not have the same beliefs? That makes me feel like I could not be safe in this in this school district. On CBN's Global Lane, ACU spokesperson Linnea Lighting expressed shock over the district's decision. Arizona Christian University students have been working with Washington School District for over 10 years, and all of the feedback I've gotten has been positive. In fact, they've asked for more of our students to come. The Alliance Defending Freedom is representing ACU in a lawsuit against the school district. The government cannot treat people of faith worse than everyone else. These students should not lose opportunities and be punished you know, merely because of their religious beliefs. That's a blatant example of religious discrimination. At a recent board meeting, members of the community voiced outrage over the district's move. Out of the dozens of practicum students I have had throughout my WESD teaching career, 16 of them have been from ACU. All 16 have had glowing reviews in regards to their instruction, strategies, and connections made with all students. Never at any time did our students feel unsafe or attacked, ever. You are setting a precedent to the state of Arizona that discrimination towards Christians is allowed. Others argued the board's decision could cost the district millions of dollars. Meanwhile, Tucker says two board members have doubled down on their position, but the ADF is prepared to take the case through the appeals system to protect the school's freedoms of speech and religion. John. 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. The signs of Jesus soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world, as we know it, is near. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is 
Accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what? His appearance occurs on a Sunday morning. My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready! Get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.